Let's pray together. Father, the earth does grow strangely dim when we set our eyes on you. When we look to Jesus, we just see so much glory and grace, so much beauty and wonder, majesty. We see him and we look in awe of the one that we can't exactly be like. But we want to, Father. We want to imitate him. And we look at him and we, we see him raised from the dead. And we're thinking, Lord, we want that kind of resurrection life as well. And as we look around us and we see all the death and all the hardship, those that we were serving the North Micro Church yesterday who were hammered by the flooding. God, we're, we're reminded of the death and decay and the, the struggle that we have physically, emotionally, relationally, monetarily, materially. We struggle so much through this life. And yet, Father, when we look at Jesus, we see great victory. We see even death itself swallowed up and victory. Give us perseverance, Father. Help us to fix our eyes on him when we lack faith, when we struggle, when we feel hopeless. Help us to remember Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to conclude our series today, The Temple of God. Uh, I'm going to ask that you bring up my feed here. Do you guys have this? Okay. Somewhere. All right. Uh, so I'll just talk for a minute then while we get that sorted out. We've been in this series called The Temple of God for the last couple of months. And today we're closing out with the future temple. And we will kind of go through, by way of recap, some of what we've talked about along the way for those of you that might be newer, um, and also just it's helpful to refresh our memory, because everything has been leading up to this. Everything has been culminating here, the future temple, really, in some sense, the reason why any of us are here. A man raised from the dead and said, you guys are going to be raised from the dead too. This is, this is what even brings us here in the first place, that we can live beyond death. It's one of the amazing tenets of the Christian faith, resurrection from the dead. Paul said, in fact, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then no one else is going to be raised from the dead, and your faith is futile. You're still stuck in your sins. The entire Christian message revolves around Jesus' resurrection and his new body. Um, I might be without slides today, so we'll just wing it. Hopefully I have enough of the Bible up here before this thing gets too addled and rattled that uh, it will be of some service. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see a cosmic temple. Look with me in Genesis 1. Let me see if I can do this myself. Okay. Genesis 1. Verse 26, I believe. Yes, 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish, the sea, the birds, and the sky, over the livestock and all the animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And what image is this? It's an image of rulership, of co-stewardship, right? He says in verse 26 that God delegates this authority to mankind to rule alongside him. And the dominion that they're to rule is the earth, the livestock, the, the animals, that they're to have this authority to be rulers, 
And in this way, God makes mankind unique in his own image as he is the ruler. And so we see this cosmic temple in the first two chapters of Genesis where God is this creator, this ruler and authority, life giver. And he rules from this throne, metaphorically, that is over all of the cosmos. All of creation is God's temple. And then we see Eden in Genesis 3. This is, by the way, covered more thoroughly in the first lesson of this series. So if you haven't seen it, go back and watch there. I'm just going to skim over some of these things to set up where we're going to end today. This cosmic temple where God rules over all creation, and then there's this place, this special place, the Eden, the, the luxurious watertude, the luxurious watered place where heaven and earth overlap, where this place that God and his image bearers can coexist and co-rule together. That's the imagery of Eden in Genesis 1 and 2. And this serves as the foundation for the entire narrative of the Bible. And the last page of the Bible that we're going to look at in a few moments integrates with the first two pages here in Genesis. And then we talked about the old covenant temple. So first we begin with this cosmic temple in Genesis 1 and 2. And then the rest of the Old Testament, we see the temple go through several iterations. And the temple, now after mankind is banished out of Eden and heaven and earth no longer overlap in that special place, we see a new place, a physical building where heaven and earth overlap, where God dwells to meet with mankind. That's the whole purpose and imagery of the temple in the Old Testament, whether it's the tabernacle while the Israelites are wandering in the desert, or it becomes Solomon's temple, where David says, I want to build a permanent place for God to be able to meet with mankind, and heaven and earth overlap, and he allows David's son Solomon to build it in all of its grandeur. And then it's destroyed because God's people, where he meets with, and heaven and earth overlap, sin and disobey, and they won't repent and turn to him. They turn to other gods and worshiping idols and themselves. And so destruction comes upon these people. The temple is destroyed. The Jews are distraught. They rebuild it again with what's commonly referred to as Herod's temple in the times of Hezekiah. It gets rebuilt, and the Jews mourn because it's not nearly as pretty as the last one. And all the while, God is speaking through these prophets, guys, this isn't really what it's all about. It's not all about this temple worship as you understand it. It's not all about this sacrificial system as you understand it. God is saying, I am on a mission to restore Eden with all people. And then we get to Jesus. And Jesus becomes this image of the perfect temple, which is no longer a building, but a body, a life, an individual who represents God perfectly to the people and the people to God. And the New Testament writers would go on to say that Jesus is now our great high priest. He, he replaces the function that the priesthood had. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, let me just stop right now. You're going to glaze over. Because I am literally like flying over at 30,000 feet of a couple thousand page book in about 10 minutes. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, keep trying to read it, okay? <laughs> It'll make sense eventually. I've been reading this thing pretty consistently now for two decades, and I still feel like I'm just barely skimming the surface of understanding this book. So please try to stay with me even if you are very unfamiliar with the Bible, because it is leading somewhere. Jesus, Paul refers to Jesus as the new and last Adam. So even for Paul in the New Testament, he connects Jesus as this living temple back to the Genesis 1 and 2 creation story where Adam lives in perfect harmony and union with God, which of course is broken in chapter 3. But Paul says Jesus is the new Adam. He is the one that lives in perfect harmony with God. And he's the last Adam. This is in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, which you know, Sam just read. So in the Old Testament, we see this tabernacle and this temple, they become a replica, if you will, kind of like a miniature marred version 
of the cosmic temple in Genesis 1 and 2. And then in the New Testament, we see that Jesus comes and fulfills the law and says that he himself now is the temple of God, the exact representation of God where God dwells, the living tabernacle, John 1. John says Jesus came and tabernacled amongst us. God came and templed amongst us in that guy. That's astounding. Like, it's so, it's so easy to get lost, right? 2,000 years we've been hearing this stuff. But, like, God tented in, in, that, in that guy right there. What? Y'all would throw me in a padded room if I came in and said, hey, guys, you guys are going to see God dwell amongst you in me. And then gets what? It gets even crazier because that's exactly what the New Testament says. That now, any of us who are in Jesus, we become the temple. We are the living, walking, breathing Edens. The heaven and earth overlap where God dwells with people. And then we talked about, for a while, all of the implications of that. What does it mean for us, the church, individually and collectively, to be the temple of God? We talked about one another relationships. We talked about not being self-focused, but understanding that God living in us is to represent him to the world through us. Last week, I talked about uh, some things about like why to choose a church and when to leave a church. And apparently, I think that struck some chords. I've heard several remarks about that, about the concentric circles of truth and theology, about church shopping and church hopping, which are so common in our culture. These things are totally foreign to the New Testament. Church shopping, there was no church shopping. There's just one church, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It's not quite so easy today when you've got four churches on one corner block. It can be hard to understand and to see and experience the truth that there is one church of Jesus now, we're going to talk about the future temple. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's read there. All of this is heading somewhere in the biblical narrative and in our lives. So this idea of Eden being lost, heaven and earth overlapping, and God's relationship with mankind being broken is being restored. This is the entire message of the Bible. God is on mission to restore what people jacked up historically throughout all time and space and in our own personal lives. 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 1, Paul says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in, what earthly tent do we live in that he's referring to? Our bodies, right? For any of you over the age of 40 or 50 or 60, you feel the degradation of your tent, don't you? When you're in your 20s, you don't feel it as much, generally speaking. Your tent is nice. It pops up quickly. It's one of those like really nice modern ones where you kind of do like a snip snap and it goes poop and it like stands and it's sturdy. And then as you age, your tent starts to become one of those like, you know, wily e. Coyote type things. It's like you got one stick in the middle. And it's just kind of like falling around, don't even really look like a tent anymore. This is what Paul's talking to. He's saying, if the earthly tent we now live in is destroyed, guess what? All of our tents, they're going to be destroyed at some point. Sam's grandma's tent, right? Our brother in Mubasa, his tent, they failed, they destroyed. And all of us at some point become really aware that we are all on a one-way ticket. Every single human being thinks about death and the consequences of death and what's going to happen after death. Every single human being, I believe, in every culture, in every society, in every time period has wrestled with the concept of death. And Paul says, guess what? When our tent's destroyed... We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. 
Meanwhile, <laughs> in this 80 to 90 years that we might get, meanwhile, in that small time period that feels like forever for us, we groan, we moan, we struggle, longing to be clothed instead of this tent with a heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and we're burdened. You felt any burdens this past week? You had any inward groans? Some of us might even have some outward groans. You know, I was helping the Richardsons move in, unpacking their big old trailer truck. I had some outward groans. Like, oh, these boxes are getting heavier every year. What is wrong with me? And then I got people like Rick, you know, over there in his 70s, like, what's up, man? I got this box. I'm like, what? I'm like feeling terrible about myself, you know? Chris Hunter over there running laps around us and the Styles boys, you know? But I digress. For when we are in this tent, we groan and we're burdened. We experience that. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in this body, this tent, we are away from the Lord. Why? Because his tent was destroyed, but he was raised up to his eternal dwelling. And you know what's crazy is that people got to see that. They got to see a resurrected temple. And it like passed through walls and locked doors, but it ate food. Maybe it shapeshift, like some people couldn't recognize him. And then they're like, oh, wait, it's Jesus. Like hours later, like the new temple's kind of crazy, y'all. It's kind of cool. <laughs> it doesn't tell us a lot about it, but you get some hints of like, mm, there's some ways in which our new heavenly body is going to be similar, but there's going to be some ways that it is not. And then he just like floats away, flies away in Acts 1. <laughs> Bye-bye, where'd you go? <laughs> like, I don't know about y'all, but that sounds cool. I'm looking forward to my heavenly tent. Y'all can, can do what you want, but... He says, for we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we at, are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or or bad. That last statement is pretty sobering, right? It should have us considering the things that we do in the body. But I also want to make note of verse 8. We are confident and would prefer to be away from the body at home with the Lord. Can you honestly say that this morning? Do you know what that says? He says, I would prefer to die. This is the Christian message, y'all. If you would not prefer to die right now, you have not believed the Jesus of the Bible. Many of us in our culture think that Christianity is some like moralistic guideline to paste on top of our lives that we still lord over. The Jesus of the Bible says, no, it's better to not be here because we're groaning, we're burdened. And there are times, right, like every one of us meets a point where we're like, oh, Lord, I'm ready to go, you know. I think of that famous show, like, I'm coming up, Lord, you know. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. We all feel like that at times, right? Like, Lord, take me now. This is terrible. But then there are other times, like, you know what, it's kind of nice. I'm all right here. And then in the church, as Christians, in the faith, like, we get scared of death. We get inappropriately saddened by those who die in the faith. Paul would go on to the Corinthians and say, we don't mourn like the world who has no hope. 
Did you know that our mourning about death is fundamentally supposed to be different than the world? Because we fundamentally view death and believe death differently. We believe we're going to pass through walls and fly around and do some cool stuff. The world, what do you got? The best you got is non-existence, back to nothingness, blackness, just nothing. Okay. For the Christian, we would prefer to be away from this body and at home with the Lord. The future temple is better than what we got right now. I want to encourage us and challenge us to wrestle with that in our faith. And it gets a little easier as this body in this tent starts to degrade, right? <laughs> you start to see the future temple as far better. But man, when you're like in your 20s or whatever, you're in your teenage years, and you know how they say teenagers are invincible, you know, like you have no ailments, you know, you get over a flu in like seven minutes, like, you know, it's like Wolverine. You got some like regenerative powers, you know, like a broken bone, like crazy. I was eight years old. I snapped this wrist clear in half, fell out of a tree doing dumb boy stuff, clear in half. They reset that thing like at least three times, which means, by the way, for all you non-medical people out there, they rebroke it because it wouldn't align right. My two wrist bones kept going like this. And after the third time, the doc told my mom, like, we can't reset it no more. We're just going to have to let it do what it does and uh, likely have to have some pretty major surgery because it'll be pretty, you know, immobile. I kid you not. Those bones disappeared and regrew new ones and perfectly aligned. And the doc was like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> my tent was that pop-up tent, yo. It was like, boop. Uh, and in my mind, I'm like, why did they break it three more times? Like, couldn't you have just not done? Anyways, in our younger days, perhaps, we're not as convinced that the heavenly temple is far greater than this one. As we age, we understand, man, this tent is very temporary. We groan. We are burdened. But the truth is that no matter where, our, where we're at in the stage of our degradation of our tent, the next one's way better. It is immeasurably better. And so we're going to read in Revelation. The last page of your Bible, most likely, Revelation 21. I'm going to invite my wife up here. She's going to read for us. Can I get this mic on? in case it's not. We're going to read Revelation 21. So uh, I want to encourage you, if you're newer or um, you have, didn't get a chance, to go back to our series on the apocalypse. We actually did a series last winter through the book of Revelation. You can find everything at the website. It's called The Apocalypse. And we cover the book of Revelation. So I won't go into a lot of the background and context here for the sake of time, but John traditionally historically referred to as the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John. John the Revelator. He has one revelation, not many revelations, okay? The book of Revelation is about a vision that this man has about the future, the future coming kingdom and temple of God. And at the end, here in chapter 21, he has a vision of what heaven is going to be like and what it's going to be like for us. Chapter 21 of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every te tear from their eyes. There will, no longer, there will be no more death, no, mo no mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who, has seated, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. 
But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and, sh and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with, seven, with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high and as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the, cities, of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun, the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will any one who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those who, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you. So let's take a minute here to process what we just read. For those of you that have been a part of this series, Let's compare Revelation 21 to some of the things that we've talked about already and some of the passages that we've read. What do you see in Revelation 21 that mirrors or reflects things that we read in the cosmic temple of Genesis 1 and 2? What do you see? It's great when I see people's eyes going back down to the Bible. It's awesome. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The sun and the moon mentioned at the end, right, are not needed anymore. Okay, so there's, there's a correlation there to the sun and the moon being created in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, interestingly, Genesis 1 and 2 is highlighting not so much the creation of the sun and moon, but the fact that they are created things, that they are in dominion over, or under God. They are under God's dominion because many of the ancient peoples believed that the celestial beings were God's. And the writer of Genesis is making the point, they're not. God is God, and he runs all of that. Yes, sir. So, um, New Jerusalem, like in the very beginning of Genesis, before the fall of Adam and Eve, sin will no longer be existent. That's right. Okay, so we see this restoration of sin being removed, just like it was in the cosmic temple in Genesis 1 and 2 and Eden. What else? What else do you see? How about the Old Testament tabernacle and temple of Solomon? And Herod, what, what uh, similarities do you see for those of you that have read a lot of your Old Testament, especially the really riveting parts where it goes through very detailed descriptions of how the temple was put together? What do you see? What characteristics and similarities do you find? Yes, ma'am. That's right, the precious, the precious gems. And what does that correlate to in the Old Testament? <clears throat> the 
were also precious stones and metals, right? The high priest actually wore a special ephod that had 12 special jewels on it to go into the presence of God. John is intentionally pulling in all these themes. This isn't random, right? And John is connecting this future temple that he talks about at the end of chapter 21 through the entire arc from Genesis 1 up until he's writing. And he's correlating this temple as going through all of these phases of the temple that we've seen. In the beginning, he says there's a new heaven and a new earth. What does the writer in Genesis begin with? God created the heavens and the earth, right? So he's beginning his dialogue about this future temple that he's about to talk about with the first line of the narrative of the Bible. And then he says, the first heaven and the first earth, they've all passed away. There is this newness. He talks about how God's dwelling place is now among people and he will dwell with them, which again was what was going on there in the cosmic temple in Genesis 1 and 2. God and man were able to dwell together perfectly in harmony. Heaven and earth could overlap. Man could walk in the cool of the day in the garden with God, whatever that means. It means that God and man were able to coexist in some way together that they cannot right now because of the fall. John says all of that's going to come back. He's making it again. It's going to be made new. And then he goes through and talks about what the, the new Jerusalem is going to be like. The temple in Jerusalem, as you read some of those riveting passages, right, was very ornate, very detailed. It goes through great descriptions on exactly how this temple was made. Again, metaphorically speaking to the grandeur of God and his value and his worth, that where God meets with people, that place has everything the best that this place can offer. And even then, it still falls short. And John says, guess what? This new city, this new Jerusalem, is going to have all the best there. Now, is it going to be exactly 200 cubits and 12,000 stadia? What happens if you get to heaven and the city is actually 199 feet thick in the wall and not 200? Are you going to be like, you duped me? I think you see quickly that this is very likely poetic metaphor language. It's not designed to be in like we read it. We tend to read it as like a blueprint, right? We, we come from a very analytical, like engineering, scientific, methodological type of culture. So that's how we think, right? As you go back to some of the Bema stuff, the Eastern versus Western thought and worldview. We're like, okay, Lord, it's going to be 200 feet thick. Hmm, is that thick enough? I don't know. Is that going to support these 12 layers? You know, like, that's not the point. The point is that this temple is the best. And this place that God and man now dwell is perfect. And that we struggle to even put language to it. So we have to use the very best things that we can understand and know. And then as he kind of meanders and traverses through this old, old covenant from, or, you know, pre-fall cosmic temple, the new heaven and the new earth, then he meanders through comparing this new city, this new Jerusalem with the old covenant temple of Solomon. Now he gets to what the future temple is going to be like in verse 22. He says, guess what? In the future temple, there is no temple. For John's reader, this is the new thing. This is the paradigm shift. For all of their history, God needs a place where heaven and earth can overlap. Guess what? In the new heaven and earth, there is no such place. It's all overlapping. He says, there is no temple. You don't go anywhere to meet with God because God and the Lamb are its temple. God and the Lamb are able to constantly and perfectly dwell with mankind and the city doesn't need celestial beings and stars that burn out and moons that give brightness that people tend to attribute power and worship towards. He says, guess what? None of that's going to happen. There's no idolatry there. The Lord is the only one that is worshipped. And then he says, the nations will walk by its light and the kings on the earth will bring their splendor into it. What does that mean? 
It means that there will be peace. It means that the nations and civilizations of man will no longer war against one another, but that all the nations will come to this new temple where there is no temple, and they will be at peace with one another. We could just stop right there and have a whole series on that. Wouldn't it be nice for us to finally get along and have complete peace with each other and not slaughter each other? John says it's going to be so one day. And he says, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. What does that mean? There's no danger. There's no need to lock your door. You ever had that panicky thought, like, did I lock my door? Did I lock my car? Did I leave my car unlocked with a spare key in it? (laughs) Guess what? You won't have to deal with any of that one day because there's no threat of danger. There's no night. Night being, again, representative, not that it's actually going to get dim, but that there's no danger. There's nothing that poses any threat to anyone. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it, again, indicating this idea that it is for everyone. It is not like the temple of the Hebrews that believed that their ethnic identity was what allowed God to dwell with them. And of course, the prophets said so over and over again that that was not the case. But John underscores this and says, all nations will be brought into this place and nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hearkening back to what we just talked about, the deeds done in the body, right? Like what we do in this temple matters and it does have an effect on us in the future temple or not. So as we close out here, I'm going to invite several people to come up and pray and to pray about this future temple, to pray about the fact that one day every tear will be removed. There'll be no more sorrow or death or decay. Our little like, you know, single, single stick tents that are all flappy and that all of that's going to be gone and to pray for courage and perseverance until that day comes. I'm going to invite you guys up that are going to pray, and you guys can pray uh, one at a time here on this microphone. Everybody can come on up that I, that I had asked. Thank you, guys.